Now to officially start our meeting, Commissioner Bachelor, would you yes. lead us the Pledge of Allegiance? Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. First item on the agenda this morning is the approval of the regular session minutes of September 28, 2021. Could I have a motion to approve those minutes? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion or corrections? Hearing none, call the roll, please. Commissioner Painter? Yes. Commissioner Bachelor? Yes. Commissioner Corcoran? Yes. Second item on our agenda this morning is a proclamation designation of October as Domestic Violence Awareness Month in Claremont County. Do we have Stephanie Shue with us this morning? Good morning. Good morning. Today. Today is a proclamation for Domestic Violence Awareness Month in Claremont County, Ohio. Whereas violence against women and children continues to be a more prevalent social problem, and whereas the problem of domestic violence is not confined to any group of people, but crosses all economic, racial, and societal barriers, and whereas the crime of domestic violence violates an individual's privacy, dignity, security, and humanity, through the systematic use of physical, emotional, sexual, psychological, and economic control and or abuse. And whereas the impact of domestic violence is wide ranging, directly affecting women and their children and society as a whole. And whereas it is survivors of domestic violence themselves who've been at the forefront of efforts to bring peace and equity to the home. And whereas it is fitting to set aside a special time to bring this issue to the attention of all Claremont County citizens so they can become better informed and involved in programs to eliminate this epidemic from our society. And to also let families know that they are not alone and there is help and support and available for them. And whereas the Claremont County Family Violence Task Force affiliated with the Little Fork Family Advocacy Center is joining forces with victim service programs, criminal justice officials, and concerned citizens throughout Claremont County and across the state of Ohio to observe Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Now, therefore, we, the board of the Claremont County Commissioners, do proclaim the month of October 2021 as Domestic Violence Awareness Month in Claremont County, Ohio. It's signed by myself, Claire Corcoran, Bonnie Bachelor and Commissioner David Painter. And we thank you for being with us today, and we thank you for all you do. And you Little much. Fork Advocacy has done a wonderful job. And keep up the good work with Absolutely. your work. Thank you so thank much. Thank you so much. Anything you'd like to say? Uh, we just always want to thank you for your continued support through the years. Uh, the pandemic has been a huge, huge problem for a lot of victims of domestic violence. And we like it to everyone, for everyone to know that even though we did sell our building on 4th Street we because it was, wasn't conducive to what we needed anymore um, so we did sell but we're very much alive in Claremont County we are in courts uh, we have our shelter still in Claremont County uh, housing women that has been a challenge but we still are housing up to 14 women and children to this day shelter is full um, we work in conjunction with CPS Claremont County Prosecutor's Office all the local police departments so we're still out there um, we will, through the uh, month of October, post all of our information through the Claremont County Government uh, webpage. I will get that to Mike um, soon. I haven't done that yet. Sorry about that. But thank you for your support. We are here um, if you need us. The hotline is up 24-7. You call the hotline if anybody needs it. And like I said, we'll post that number with Mike on the government page. But thank you for your continued support. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all you do. Moving on to item D, public participation. We've reached the public participation section of the agenda. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to address the board? Seeing and hearing none. Moving on to item E, consent agenda. Board, this has been prepared for you in advance. Are there any deletions or corrections to the consent agenda? No. Hearing none, could I have a motion to approve? I'll make the motion. Is there a second? Second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, call the roll, please. Commissioner Bachelor. Yes. Commissioner Painter. Yes. Commissioner Corcoran. Yes. Before we move to the non-consent agenda, 
Item I, County Staff Elected Officials Discussions. Um, this morning we have Pam Havercos with us from the Emergency Management Department. Um, you're here to give us an update, correct? Yes. Thank you. Good morning, Pam. Good morning. So my name is Pam Havercos. I'm the Claremont County Emergency Management Agency Director. And I'm going to give a brief presentation on what our organization does. Okay. Okay, great. Can you guys hear me okay? I know I'm wearing a mask, so just tell me to speak up if you can't hear me. So just to give you a little bit of what we do, we are a county agency under the Board of County Commissioners. And our full name is the Emergency Management Agency. So our mission is to work with all of our public safety agencies and public service agencies um, to ensure that they can carry out their responsibilities of protecting lives, property, and the environment. So our role is to support them. We have four main phases of emergency management being mitigation, preparedness, response, and recovery. Hopefully, we spend the bulk of our time working on mitigation and preparedness efforts, um, but sadly, we've had a lot of instances in Claremont County that have required that we respond and recover from. So I'll go in more in depth, but um, just to give you an idea of what we do in each of these phases, um, you know, we are required under the mitigation phase to do an all-hazard mitigation plan, which we just recently adopted in the county to keep us compliant. Um, we also do a lot of hazard vulnerability analysis, so looking at the hazards that could affect the county and how, um, what we could do to reduce or eliminate that risk. Um, we also look at lessons learned from past instances. Um, you know, specifically right now we're looking at what has gone well with the COVID-19 response and what we could do better in the next, in the future. We also have what's called a local emergency planning committee, which um, looks at the hazardous materials that the county has, um, what materials are coming into and flowing through the county and how we can look at reducing that risk. Um, we also work with our public safety agencies and our local municipalities on the enforcement of fire code. Um, and building code again that reduces the risk of um, potential hazards to our population we also have a very strict um, floodplain regulations and the implementation of that again reduces the risk um, for flooding which is a major hazard for us under the preparedness phase we do a lot of planning so i'll talk more in depth, depth about the planning that we do but it's about building relationships with our partners so that we can ensure that we understand who has what resources and what services they provide and then making sure that we're connecting those partners um, before an event so that they're readily available after an event to um, provide services to our public. And then we do exercises and a lot of public education. As I said, sadly, we've had a lot of instances, tornadoes, flooding, um, high wind events, COVID um, that has caused us to respond. So again, we work with our public safety agencies who are first responders and our role is to support them to make sure that they can continue to respond. Uh, so we do a lot of making sure that they have the resources they need. Um, we try to work with those public safety agencies to make sure we're addressing those basic unmet human needs for their population, especially after they've had an incident. Um, we work with our utility providers to make sure that we can restore critical infrastructure um, and utilities. We coordinate, again, across the board with just information sharing. And um, if we do reach that threshold where we need to make a disaster declaration, we would be the central clearinghouse to receive those disaster declarations and then submit them up to the state. We could activate our emergency operations center, and we also work with our partners to make sure that we're documenting all of our disaster related expenses and activities on the recovery side again response and recovery go hand in hand so we do a lot of um, damage assessment to determine how the severity and the scope of the disaster we work um, with our government and um, partners to make sure that we're continuing essential services we work with our local communities on debris management um, if we need to bring in donations and volunteers we work on coordination of that and then if there are any assistance programs that become available, we work to make sure that that information is readily available. Again, at the end of the day, we want to make sure that our local um, communities can recover quickly and that our public can recover quickly um, so we can establish a long-term recovery committee, which I'll talk more about here in a minute. 
again, our office is relatively small. Um, we have a staff now of approximately three and a half. Um, but it really takes the coordination of all of our public safety agencies, all of the local communities, to really make emergency management successful. So as I said, emergency management is a team effort. It can't be done um, alone. So looking at, um, as I mentioned, we have done an, an all hazard mitigation plan and we look at what potential hazards could affect the county. Um, so we could be affected by natural disasters, technological hazards, or human caused events. And I think pretty much we've had most of these at some point happen in the county. Thankfully, none of them have been uh, terribly severe. Uh, well, COVID is probably one of the most costly events that we'll have and probably the most challenging event that we'll face. Um, we have had tornadoes and flooding, which have also uh, been relatively significant in the county. So as I said, we have an all hazard mitigation plan. We are required by 44 CFR part 201 and the Robert T. Stafford Act to have an all hazard mitigation plan. Um, we brought all of our partners together to identify what hazards we thought were the most, the county was most vulnerable to. And then we looked at what actions we might take um, throughout the county to reduce or eliminate that risk. And this graphic, while it's difficult to see, outlines um, some of the actions that we had discussed um, implementing across the county. This plan is valid for five years, so in about two and a half years, we'll start the process to um, update the plan so that it remains um, current. And again, one of the main reasons why this is so important is it allows all of our municipalities to be eligible for pre or post or pre disaster mitigation grant programs that come out annually. Um, there are also mitigation grants that come out when we ever, whenever the country as a whole has a large scale uh, presidential declaration as such as COVID. Um, there are uh, an allotment of funds based on how much is awarded in the, um, the de declaration as a whole that have to be allocated to mitigation grants. There are some statistics out there that say for every dollar that we spend on mitigation, um, we're actually saving $4 in response. So there is some significance to um, focusing on mitigation. Again, if anyone's interested at the bottom of the screen is where they can find our mitigation plan. It is readily available if anyone wants to read through it. And they're always welcome to call our office if they have questions about the mitigation plan. We also have an emergency operations plan. I believe I brought our base plan back um, to the Board of County Commissioners um, just a few months ago. And the base plan just looks at how we would coordinate across the jurisdictions um, and the layers of support that would come as an event um, rises from a local incident um, to affect multiple jurisdictions. And even if we had to coordinate with our regional partners as well as our um, state partners and the federal government should the need arise for us to get additional resources. The emergency operations plan is extensive. It's more than just a singular, singular plan. Um, as I said, we have a base plan. And then we have functional annexes as well as hazard specific annexes. Um, so our base plan is readily available on our website, but we maintain those functional annexes um, and we continue to update those functional annexes. So if anyone ever has any questions, they're more than welcome to reach out to us. So just to go over, you know, how um, a response rolls out. So, you know, when an incident happens, people will immediately call 911. And we have a county communication center as well as um, Union Township has a communication center and Northeast um, Communication Center does dispatching. So that call comes in to one of those three facilities and they start making calls out to their initial um, response partners, whoever their public safety agencies are. As that incident escalates, additional partners might be brought in you know, some of the primary partners that are brought in is your public utilities, your utility companies and your public works agencies. So your service department, your road department, the county engineer, uh, department of transportation. If it continues to escalate, that's where emergency management would get involved to help with the coordination of those external resources. And we may also need to reach out to our faith based and nonprofit partners and even the private sector for additional resources. 
especially if we have to get into um, where we are doing providing mass care. Um, so again, feeding and sheltering of residents that may be displaced. So as the incident escalates, um, emergency management takes on a much bigger role. And so we have, generally we do coordination. Um, we, you know, are linking partners together um, to provide services. But in terms of coordination, we secure resources to support our first responders. We could activate our emergency operations center if it's needed. You know, as um, incidences have unfolded and COVID in particular, we're starting to realize that maybe we don't need a brick and mortar physical facility where we bring resources and people into, but maybe we go out into the field and support our first responders out in the field, making it easier to coordinate and communicate um, what's needed. But we have an EOC. Um, we actually have two backup EOCs in the county. Um, so we always have a facility to go to if we needed to. Some of our major functions would be, again, mass care, feeding and sheltering. Again, making sure that the residents that are displaced can get food, can get shelter, they can get information on uh, resources that are available and any other unmet needs that they might have in order to get through that immediate emergency. We make sure that we're coordinating amongst all of the public safety agencies and communities on public information. Again, that's one of the most challenging incidents um, is when a disaster occurs and making sure we're all on the same page about what information we're sharing with the public and how the public can get more information and resources. Um, damage assessment becomes time critical because we want to know the scope and severity of the incident. Um, and then restoration of infrastructure becomes really vital, um, making sure that we're restoring the power, um, internet, um, cable, cell phones. Um, we want to make sure all of those things are back up and running to make sure we can respond, respond effectively. And then continuity of government. We want to make sure that uh, the public has access to get to critical services. In terms of COVID-19, we've done a lot of more direct support. Um, we have managed a call center with um, volunteers to make sure that we could answer the public's questions, um, that we helped with the scheduling for the COVID-19 vaccinations. And um, we continue to do that even now as we move into the rollout of the boosters. We have managed a warehouse full of PPE to distribute to our public safety agencies. Specifically, it started out when there were um, shortages in the, or difficulties in the supply chain but we continue to manage that even now and provide PPE to all of our public safety agencies, local schools, and local healthcare facilities. Um, we continue to support public health with uh, addressing individuals and families who have unmet needs. So if individuals and families become quarantined or isolated and they're not able to access um, food or other resources, um, they would coordinate with their contact tracer and the contact tracer would link up with us and we have been working with some of our faith-based nonprofit partners to get food delivered to those individuals and families so that they can um, stay in their home and fulfill their quarantine or isolation period. And then we continue to support public health with the max vaccination operations. And across the whole um, board, we have been working to identify um, who's providing which vaccines and making sure that our public understands where they can go to get those vaccinations. As well as um, we've been spending a lot of time in the last few weeks on where people can go to get um, test kits, you know, making sure that if they're not readily available at retail outlets that we're bringing them in and providing them to the public for free. Um, right now people can go or contact the local libraries or the YMCA to receive those uh, free test kits. So as we move into recovery, as I said, most of the time this runs hand in hand. We're doing recovery at the same time that we're doing response. We heavily focus on debris management. Again, uh, in the, after, um, after a disaster, you wanna make sure that you're clearing roads so your public safety agencies can access um, and provide <clears throat> services. But over time, we're working on removing debris from um, communities so that they can get back to some semblance of normal. Um, we do a lot on donations management, um, coordination of that, as well as um, volunteer management. 
you know, after major tornadoes, we have coordinated community cleanup days um, to help residents who have a lot of debris on their property that they may not be able to take care of themselves. So we've been able to work with volunteers to get volunteers on private property to bring it to the right of way. And then we work with the public service agencies to chip it up, especially woody debris right there, um, saving the county and the municipalities lots of money and effort in taking that woody debris to a landfill. We also do a lot of taking that debris and separating it so it goes to the right landfill or right location. So we work with the Office of Environmental Quality and the Adams Claremont Solid Waste District to make sure that we are um, following those procedures. And then really focus on community economic restoration. So in terms of disasters, um, you know, most we mostly focus on government agencies, but the reality is a disaster takes a long time for communities to recover. And um, one of the things I've realized uh, is just this, um, the graph of how uh, disasters unfold. So at the bottom chart is, um, you know, you have your government uh, agencies responding and there's a quick spike and we all respond, but then quickly we kind of recede into the background and we go back to doing daily activities. But that community, it could take days, months, years for them to recover. So who's really doing that recovery? And that is being filled by our faith-based and nonprofit partners and even our private sector partners coming together. So again, in emergency management, we continue to build a long-term recovery committee to make sure that we are identifying those unmet needs in that community. And then again, building relationships and coalitions of agencies to provide those services to make sure that our communities and our residents can recover from that disaster. Again, a lot of people feel that, you know, if we had a large scale disaster, FEMA would come in and provide a lot of services. No amount of money that FEMA would provide in a disaster declaration to an individual or family would make a, a family whole. So again, it's really important that we build these coalitions to ensure that um, residents have the service or at least access to services um, to build whatever that new semblance of normal is for them. So that's where we're at today. So I appreciate the opportunity to come in and present and just give you an overview of what emergency management does. Um, do you guys have any questions? Yeah, but Pam, before you leave today, and I know you're keeping your social distance, but we would like to get a picture with you this morning. Oh, yeah. If you want to even stand in front sure. of the board here, then we can stand up behind and get a picture. Okay, thank but you. this is our certificate of appreciation that we're presenting to the Emergency Management Agency today. Um, we appreciate everything you do for the citizens of Claremont County, and we thank you for being with us. Great, thank you right. very much. I want to really stand in the middle, maybe, and we'll just stand behind you. How's that work? Works fine. Okay, we're good there. Are you smiling, Pam? <laughs> <laughs> that was good. Great. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. You, Pam. thank you, Pam, thank you, Pam, and thank your staff, please. Also, before we go to our um, non consent agenda this morning, we have another presentation by Michael McNamara. Good morning. Good morning, Commissioners. Michael McNamara. I'm the Director of Community and Economic Development. So uh, I've been speaking to leaders, local groups, and our local governments about the benefits and possibilities of a land bank in Claremont County since our, I arrived here 14 months ago. And this presentation is a quick summary of a land bank and outreach to a broader uh, audience as an informative measure. So what is a land bank? Land banks are quasi-governmental, meaning they consist of their own board of directors, are a nonprofit organization, but their activities are regulated by the Ohio Revised Code. Land banks in their current statewide form came into existence in Ohio around 2010 as a response to the foreclosure crisis that resulted from the Great Recession. The goal of land banks is to restore properties to the marketplace. Land banks are authorized by the Ohio Revised Code. The technical name and official name on documents and deeds is a land reutilization corporation. 
Land Re Reutilization Corporation duties and uses are outlined in Ohio Revised Code Chapters 1724 and 5722. Land banks have either five, seven, or nine members, and a land bank board must always have at least two commissioners uh, and the county treasurer. Uh, there's typically a city representative as well as a township representative on a land bank board. Ohio's first land bank started in Cuyahoga County in 2008. Cuyahoga, Cuyahoga was a pilot county. In 2010, counties of larger size in Ohio were permitted to start land banks, and many of them did. And by 2016, the legislature allowed all Ohio counties to have land banks. As of March this year, 56 of Ohio's 88 counties had land banks, and I believe that number has since grown. Um, <clears throat> So land banks have a lot of uses. Some counties use land banks to acquire parcels in distressed areas in order to package them for redevelopment. Land banks also have unique title clearing capabilities that allow for a distressed parcel to return to the marketplace, uh, free of liens and ownership battles. Uh, land banks can also rehabilitate a structure, demolish an unsafe structure, lease property, or sell property. The goal of a land bank is to address distressed properties so that they can be reintroduced into the marketplace. Whereas a community improvement corporation has an economic development focus, a port authority has a finance and incentive focus for businesses, land banks were created with a community development focus in mind. As we have visited with, with numerous local governments, we have discussed the possibilities and opportunities that a land bank can provide. A land bank is a tool for a local government to address blighted properties. A land bank provides a path to remediate an area's worst properties. Land banks are also a prefer, uh, preferred lead entity for state and federal dollars. In the past, land banks were preferred or required to take advantage uh, of funds like Moving Ohio Forward. They were a preferred lead entity in that uh, program and NIP stabilization funds. Currently, the state legislature has announced that all Ohio counties will receive $1 million for brownfield remediation and an additional $500,000 for uh, distressed residential properties. The guidance is currently being written on that, and I understand that the rules will make it easier for counties with a land bank to access, spend, and report those funds. And a land bank is perfectly positioned to be the county's agent for brownfield and residential remediation. So how would we target uh, properties in a land bank? Before we introduced the idea to the county, our department wanted to make sure that we had a plan on where we would recommend to target land bank activities. The land bank board would make the decisions, but our department can provide uh, the land bank board with an informed approach. For instance, our department's GIS division can plot out the 180 parcels identified as distressed properties by our local governments. And these are this uh, map uh, represents a uh, plotting of parcels that were provided to us by local governments when our community development uh, depart our division reached out and said, hey, send us what you believe we need to address. So we can vet these properties and make sure that they meet eligibility requirements. And a lot of that, a lot of times that means they need to be abandoned, tax um, delinquent, and other components can uh, lead to a distressed property. So our GIS division then has the ability to create layers that can be overlaid on this map of distressed properties, and those layers can include a heat map of 911 calls, low to moderate income areas where CDBG often targets, areas of high delinquency rates, and other layers. So as each layer becomes visible, we will see the areas of the county in which we need to st strategically address. And the Community and Economic Development Department can then assess these areas and determine what resources can be brought to bear in order to address blight, improve the quality of life, reduce fire and police calls, and promote a safer, cleaner neighborhood. And I believe, you know, if Pam is uh, still here, um, one of the nice things about Claremont County is we have department head meetings, and uh, in those um, we talk about what we're working on and the other department heads can see what we're working on. And Pam has been uh, communicative on areas that uh, she feels that a land bank can be helpful in addressing. So I think another layer that we can even look at is where they um, see uh, efforts where we can coordinate efforts with uh, another department like EMA uh, and be strategic in that sense. 
So the next steps, uh, the process for creating a land reutilization corporation is a multi-step process. It's a very public and a very deliberate process. The first step is to pass a resolution to create the land bank and ask the county treasurer to file the articles of incorporation with the Ohio Secretary of State. And I have been in constant contact with our uh, county treasurer, and she is very supportive of this um, uh, process and is uh, ready if the board approves um, the resolution to file our articles of incorporation. So once the land bank is formed, the commissioners would then consider a resolution designated the Land Reutilization Corporation as agent for the county and directs the land bank to create an agreement and plan. Once this agreement and plan have been approved by the land bank board, the commissioners then consider the agreement and plan for approval. At that point, the land bank is ready to begin operations. And then um, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer those. That was the nutshell. And I thank you for your time today. Um, I'll return later in the agenda to introduce the first resolution required to create a land bank in Claremont County. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Michael, before you, yes, before you leave, just one question. Yes. The funding that's associated with the land bank, uh, could you just explain that a little bit, where that comes from? Sure. So in addition to whatever um, grants or whatever um, funds that the state makes available that a land bank might administer, uh, most land banks, or, or uh, I'm not sure if any land banks are an exception to this in Ohio, are funded through delinquent tax assessment collections. So there is a large pot of money that is collected every uh, after every certification, and these are delinquent uh, people who have paid their taxes delinquently, all the fees associated with those taxes, and all of the interest associated with those back taxes. So in that pot, 2.5 percent of that pot would is used to uh, fund the prosecutor's office. 2.5% of that fund is used to uh, fund the uh, treasurer's office. And then up to 5% of that fund can be used to fund land reutilization corporations. And uh, with that money, um, the Ohio Revised Code uh, dictates how that a land bank can use that money and will, for what purposes and um, how it, how it would be used. So the remainder of that pot, so that, that takes up 10% of that um, pot, the remainder of that pot then is distributed back to the communities where those delinquent taxes were paid. So that includes school districts, local governments, and other taxing authorities. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Moving on to our agenda this morning, um, we're going to move on to non-consent agenda, which is item F, starting with number seven. And this is the Board of County Commissioners Resolution number 163-21, Payment of Bills. It's a recommendation that the Board of County Commissioners adopt the resolution number 163-21, resolving to approve payment to vendors in the total amount of $2,902,000. $71.87 as set forth in the BCC approval invoice report for checks dated October 6, 2021, BCC directed prepaid invoices reports and the procurement card transaction report as presented by the county auditor on October the 4th, 2021 and further authorizing the county auditor to issue warrants for same pursuant to section 319.16 of the Ohio revised code. Is there a motion to pay the bills? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? One. Holly, that 2-9, <clears throat> there was one large, large warrant issued on that, wasn't there? Like at 2.2 million? Yes, that would have been our 2021 road resurfacing. I believe Barrett Paving actually encompassed the majority of the $2 million. So that was the highest payments out of this week's um, invoice. <clears throat> so would I assume that they have completed $2.2 million worth of road paving in Claremont County? That would be safe to assume, sir. I would think so. <laughs> Thank you. Any other discussion this morning? No. Hearing none, call the roll, please. Commissioner Bachelor. Yes. Commissioner Painter. Yes. Commissioner Corcoran. Yes. <clears throat> Item number eight, Craig Reisner. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Craig Reisner, County Engineer's Office. Item number eight is a recommendation of Jeremy Evans, County Engineer, with the concurrence of Thomas Igel, County Administrator to execute record plat number 629-3300 for the replat of lot number 618 in the following subdivision in Miami Township 
This is Woods at Miami Trail Subdivision, Section 11C, Lot Number 618, and the purpose is to describe a 10-foot private storm easement and a 20-foot City of Loveland water main easement. Board, you've heard the recommendation to execute record plat number 629-3300 for the replat of lot 618 in the following subdivision, which is in Miami Township for the woods at Miami Trail subdivision. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Is there a second? Second. <clears throat> Any discussion? Hearing none, call the roll, please. Commissioner Painter? Yes. <clears throat> Commissioner Batchelor? Yes. Commissioner Corcoran? Yes. Thank you. Item number nine, Scott Brewer. Morning. Yes, Scott. Good morning. <clears throat> um, recommendation of myself, Director of CTC, to adopt a resolution number 164-21, resolving to authorize Thomas J. Igle, County Administrator, to execute the grant agreement by and between the Board of Claremont County Commissioners on behalf of CTC and the Ohio Department of Transportation in the amount of 196 thousand one hundred fifty three dollars pursuant to the criteria for state fiscal year 2022 and in concert with the grant application ratified by the board of the county commissioners on 6 2021 relative thereto board to heard the recommendation to adopt resolution number 164-21 and this is for the grant agreement and it's for the ohio urban transit program as read is there a motion to approve so moved is there a second second any discussion hearing none call the roll please commissioner bachelor yes commissioner painter yes commissioner corcoran yes thank you scott thank you. item number 10 desmond meta good morning to you good morning commissioners desmond mayata community <laughs> Community Development Administrator. Uh, this is a recommendation of the Community Development Administrator with the concurrence of the Director of the Department of Community and Economic Development to authorize Claire B. Corcoran, President of the Board of County Commissioners, to execute the grant agreement by and between uh, the county and the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. Uh, this is for the provision of funding for grant number B-21-UC-39-0010 dash 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 relative to the fiscal year 2021 U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development Community Development Block Grant Program for Claremont County in the amount of $1,015,543 for the grant period of 7-1-2021 through 9-1-2028. So commissioners, this is Claremont County's 2021 program year allocation of CDBG funds. Our action plan has been approved by HUD and this is the next step to be able to access these funds. Thank you. Board, you've heard the recommendation to execute the grant agreement, and this is what the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development for the provision of funding for the grant number B-21-UC-39-0010 dash 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 relative to the fiscal year 2021 U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development Community Block Grant Program and CDBG Program. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, call the roll, please. Commissioner Painter? Yes. Commissioner Bachelor? Yes. Commissioner Corcoran? Yes. Thank you. Item number 11, Michael McNamara. Good morning again. Our commissioners, Michael McNamara, Director of Community and Economic Development. Uh, item number 11 is recommendation of myself, Director, Department of Community and Economic Development, with the concurrence of Greg Bickford, Assistant County Administrator, Claremont County, Ohio, to adopt resolution number 165-21, resolving to form the Claremont County Land Reutilization Corporation as set forth in Ohio Revised Code chapters 5722 and 1724 and requesting the county treasurer to file articles of incorporation with the Ohio Secretary of State and to take other such steps as necessary in concert with the Claremont County Prosecuting Attorney's Office to organize such corporation. Board, you've heard the recommendation and this is to adopt the resolution number 165-21 resolving to form the Claremont County Land Reutilization Corporation, and this is to file the Articles of Incorporation. Is there a motion to approve? I make the motion. Any second? Second. Any discussion? Michael, before we, we vote on this, I just wanted to say thanks to you and to the Economic Development Department and everybody that worked hard. This has been a request of many, many townships, villages, and cities throughout Claremont County for a long, long time. You know, since they don't really possess the 
the budgetary uh, re requirements to take care of blighted and, and abandoned properties throughout Claremont County. So I know this is something that uh, they have, have wanted for a long time. I know it took some hard work to do, and I just want to say thanks thanks to everyone that, that worked on it. Thank you. Mr. Batchel, anything this morning? No. All right. Just um, thank you for your presentation this morning and clarifying what we're doing on this. And secondly, I have already pulled the uh, higher revised codes and started reading it. It's very detailed. <laughs> thank you for all your work, everyone. All right. Finish with our discussion. Could I have a roll? Um, call the roll, please. Commissioner Bachelor. Yes. Commissioner Painter. Yes. Commissioner Corcoran. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Item number twelve. Pam Havercross, you're on again today. <laughs> Pam Havercross, Clermont County and Emergency Management Agency Director. Um, item number twelve is a recommendation of Pam Havercross, Director of the Clermont County Emergency Management Agency, with the concurrence of Greg Bickford, Assistant County Administrator to nominate the following individual for appointment to serve on the Claremont County Local Emergency Planning Committee as approved by the Claremont County Local Emergency Planning Committee on September 23rd of 2021, effective September 23rd, 2021 through August 14th of 2023, pursuant to and in compliance with section 3750.03B of the Higher Rise Code. And so we are making a recommendation that we add John McManus, who's with the Claremont County uh, soil and Water Conservation District to be added to our LEPC membership. Thank you. Board, you've heard the recommendation to nominate John McManus for appointment to serve on the Claremont County Local Emergency Planning Committee. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, call the roll, please. Commissioner Painter? Yes. Commissioner Batchelor? Yes. Commissioner Corcoran? Yes. Thank you, Pam. Item number 13. Mr. Myself, this is uh, for establishing our 2020 cost allocation rates for 911. Before I read the motion, I'd like the board to potentially consider tabling this um, throughout discussion with staff and how we've set the motion up based on your initial uh, instruction to us to work with communities within a rearage. Uh, we'd like to perhaps clarify uh, in two separate uh, actions how we're going to bill this. Um, and if you would like to have some discussion, that would be fine too. But we would like for you to consider tabling it so we can go back and uh, work this into two separate motions, still hopefully for today, uh, for your consideration to uh, separate the two out uh, so we can uh, be clear on what we're going to do. Great. Thank Sounds you. Good. Board, could we have a motion then at this time to table this item number 13? I'd, I'd move that we table item number 13 which was a recommendation of John Kiskaden Public Services with the concurrence of Mary Rains to establish the Claremont County Communication Center cost allocation rates. <clears throat> Is there a second to that motion? I'll second. Any discussion? Yeah, I think it'd be great to have a discussion about this right now because <clears throat> your recommendation for tabling is to be able to do what? Grab. So we want to separate the two motions. So the motion, if you read through it, it, sep it sets the rates for 2020, which are higher than past years because of our reduced calls. Um, it also talks about how the county can contribute additional general fund money to it to lower that rate back down to the 2019 effective rates. So we, right. so we basically get through the pandemic because of the lower calls. Um, but it also talks about the billing, and that's kind of it's it's kind of a run-on statement so we'd like to separate how we're going to uh, uh build the various jurisdictions every jurisdiction is going to get benefit of the credit if approved uh, it's just the matter in which they're billed is, is a little bit different um some uh communities have an arrearage and so we're going to deal with that in the motion as well so that that was our thought for doing that um totally up to the board how you guys want to handle that but we think we can uh, separate this out to probably hopefully provide some clarity uh to the uh, office of management and budget on how to build this I think that's a great idea to do it that way. Right. And so, so basically what we're looking at here is having a different rate for those that actually have money in the rearage versus, is that, that how we're going to do that? Yeah, so basically the way we would work on it is everybody would be billed the same rate of the established rate, which is the nine something per call. Then there's a credit issued, and then if you have an arrearage, that credit actually goes towards your arrearage. Uh, okay. And the, the rate for 2020 would be the full rate. All jurisdictions still get the benefit of the rate. It's a matter of how the funds are applied to the bills that are due, whether they're past due or, or current. So we're going to rate at the, we're going to actually bill at the 9.9, .9, but those that don't have a rearage are actually going to pay 7.4. Is that where we're at? Correct. And then those communities that have an arrearage will then get the benefit of the credit to be applied to that past due balance. Okay. 
it it would not be my recommendation to hold folks hostage that have a rearage by you know not offering that credit that's just my my particular you know recommendation <clears throat> you know there's that's open for discussion and a place obviously there have been rearages from uh, would I would I be correct in saying a couple townships would that be yeah I think we found three three communities uh, one township and two uh, villages uh, dating back to 2000 um, for, for various reasons and we are working with those uh, jurisdictions on making that current mm -hmm. I just think holding them hostage based on you know a billing rate is probably not the recommend recommended way to do it you know as with any organization that you know you owe money to you know there are other avenues to do that and especially in the COVID environment that we're in now you know maybe um, <clears throat> maybe that's since you know that additional use was you know um, during the COVID period maybe we could you know credit COVID money and then not distribute to areas that are owed money to but some other way to do that and these are past due, had nothing to do with COVID. These are past due rearages that have been on the books for quite some time. Yeah, mm -hmm. the and, rearages and we... government should be, have balanced budgets, and this is not, I'd, I'd like to see it separated out, which is the reason I'm bringing it forward at this time to you, Mr. Bickford, that we would separate out in two different items so we could vote on it. Um, I it think are we okay? Go ahead, I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. I think no, it's I'm a great just... idea, but if a township or two townships owes money in the past it needs to be taken care of because it's not fair to the other townships I don't see it as holding them hostage if they owe the bill then that it should be brought and paid well when you owe money to Cincinnati Gas and Electric they don't trade they don't change how you're billed for your electric they, they sent you, you a pass due notice and pay they cut you off. Going to get your electric <laughs> shut that, off. That's correct. So th this is holding them hostage by changing um, the billing method. That's a pretty strong word. Sorry. Well, not a strong word. I mean, okay. there uh, obviously there are charges here that townships have owed for years, right? That weren't paid when 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 it was asked for back then, right? Should have been but addressed. But it's been brought to our attention now, and it should be taken care of. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so what we've discovered is. It, the, all communities are, are paying currently. It's not an issue of refusing to pay. These charges date back to 2000. Um, I mean, moving forward, not everybody was 2000, but there's, it's not like it's, they didn't pay in, in 19 or 18. It's, it's previous. So right. I just want to make that clear. It's not, um, you know, from our standpoint, our, our collection methods, we're not obviously a collection agency, and it certainly would be you know, you know, if you want to shut off the service, that's certainly something not, that we're not going to do. We're going to work with our communities to get it paid. But we want to make sure everybody gets the benefit of the additional general fund money the commissioners are going to contribute potentially. Uh, make sure they all get the benefit in some way. Do, do any of these three townships, have any of them agreed to pay those rearages already? Yes, we have one agreement from the uh, one township to pay. Uh, and then the other two jurisdictions were working on some of the billing issues in the past to make sure everything is correct and to understand why the bills weren't paid. So, so let me ask this, if they actually pay their rear, if we go ahead and approve this at the 9-9 and then they pay their money, are we going to change the method of billing again so that they don't get billed the higher rate since they paid the rearage? Correct. So the, the, the uh, higher rate would apply to the 2019 calls. We would then apply that credit, the lower rate, to the 2019 calls, take the difference, and apply that to their past due balance and lower their past due balance. At the, um, when all bills are, are, are issued, the amount they pay is going to be equal to getting the credit. So it's the past due amount plus the credit for the 2019 calls. So it's not. Is there a reason that we're using the credit instead of just billing at 7.4? Uh, this if you don't own, owe any rearages, why would we bill at 9.9 and then credit? Why don't we just bill at 7.4? Uh, because then you would have ones with uh, the arrearage. They would get the benefit of the credit without making uh, good on their past due. This is a way to, to ensure that the uh, credit is, is passed out fairly to all communities. Greg, can I ask you this? Can we please get with these agencies and work out a payment plan. I am told that they are aware of the past due amount. 
That's correct. All, all communities are aware and we have... And again, in my way of looking at it, it is not fair to the other entities who are staying up to date and paying their 911 charges and another entity, you know, you know it's due, make plans to get it paid to the county. Mm -hmm. But not, not in a long, like this is just some of them if it's gone on for a long, long time. And this is the county's way of trying to help all the ent entities at this point, help them reduce their costs now and taking that federal money that was received and trying to help everybody in all their communities. And at that time, I, I agree with you. I think it's very unfair that some people have not paid their bill and they have the funds to pay those bills. Right. Let's just and, but, but nothing has been done to address that. So I, what I'm saying at this point is if we separated it out, which is why I asked for that motion, to separate the two, the differences in these two and uh, items that we could put on the agenda, then we could go ahead and vote on the establishment and then on that collection amount there, if that's all right. Can I, we table if, this and give you time to work on this? Sure, we have, them? yeah, we can, I can come up with, a, couple, uh, with a, a recommendation. I think that's the most equitable way to okay. spread out the credit to make sure that those that are current right. get the benefit and those that are not current still get the benefit on their past due. I think we can work through that here in the next, uh, next um, few okay. minutes. Well, and we have an executive session today, so if that would give you enough time, could we please do that? I think it so, will. All right, so we had a motion on the floor to table it for right now and to bring it back. I had a first and a second. We did our discussion. Is there a rule on it, please? Commissioner Painter. Yes. Commissioner Batchelor. Yes. Commissioner Corcoran. Yes. Thank you, everyone. We are moving on now to item number 14, Mary Rains. Good morning, Mary. Mary Rains from the Office of Management and Budget. Item 14 is a request to increase the annual appropriations for 2021 for $3,600 in the Workers' Compensation Fund regular salaries, and this is for an adjustment of an allocation of employees. Uh, the Lexington Run rid other expenses in the amount of $266,658, and this is to cover some payments for uh, the townships. Um, improvement program in those in the residential areas and then for the sheriff's concealed weapons licensings for fifteen thousand dollars for some ammunition purchases and so forth thank you board you heard the recommendation of mary rains director office of management budget <coughs> budget and this is to resolve to approve and authorize changes in the annual appropriation resolution number 191-20 for calendar year 2021 is read is there a motion to approve so moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Mary Lexington Run Rid, the 266. What is that expense, actually? The uh, Batavia Township has submitted a, um, a list of programs that they have um, completed for over a two year period for in there. Uh, I don't have the list here in front of okay. me. Okay, no, that's you know, all. But it, well, that's what it was, <laughs> is they submit a list of programs that are. Um, legitimate programs for the RID, for and, the residential those, improvement that Lexington district. And run RID was a residential TIF. The, right, there were other ones that- There were other ones. The agreed revenue from that would be- Right, the, the Lexington Run had, instead of breaking it up into all of them, we took Batavia Township's balance that they had due and just increased the appropriation for, for this particular one. So all the improvement projects are not strictly in Lexington Run. Mm -hmm. But that's where the pro the proceeds that are available for Batavia Township are located. Okay, thank you. Any other discussion on that? Okay. Hearing none. Oh, I need a. I got a second. Okay, call the roll, please. Commissioner Bachelor. Yes. Commissioner Painter. Yes. Commissioner Corcoran. Yes. Thank you. Any additions at this time to the agenda? So I'd have. Uh, we have two additions for your consideration that we'd like to add. Um, I'd like to handle them one at a time if that's acceptable. Yes. Okay, so our first edition is uh, um, a request for statement of qualifications for broadband expansion. Okay, so board at this time, I'd like to have a motion to add the first edition this morning, which is for broadband extension. Do I have a motion to add this to the agenda? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, call the roll, please. Commissioner Batchelor. Yes. Commissioner Painter. Yes. Commissioner Corcoran. Yes. 
Okay, so the first one here, it's my recommendation to approve solicitation for request for statement of qualifications for the provision of cons consultation services for broadband expansion pursuant to the specifications, therefore, and to authorize the clerk of the board to place a legal notice in the newspaper of general circulation on October 14, 2021, with the RFQs to be received until 2 p.m. local time on Thursday, November 4th, in the office of the Board of County Commissioners here in Batavia, Ohio, uh, where they will be publicly opened and read aloud. Uh, this notice will also be posted on the county's website, and um, that's it. Now, if you'd like me to talk a little bit in depth about this, as you know, we have um, our ARPA funds, and part of that is for broadband expansion, and this is a request to find a consultant to study broadband in the county. Uh, I think that if you talk to certain people, they'll say broadband's available everywhere, but practically we know that it's not. So this is our opportunity potentially to uh, infuse broadband to the rest of the county. In addition, um, also improve our utility service delivery, water and sewer, uh, by um, connecting them to our system as well so we get the best bang for our buck on the uh, ARPA funds. Great, great. Board, you've heard the uh, motion before you to approve the solicitation of requests for statement of qualifications for the provision of consultation services for broadband expansion. Is there a motion approved this morning? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, call the roll, please. Commissioner Painter? Yes. Commissioner Batchelor? Yes. Commissioner Corcoran? Yes. And you have another add on? The second one, like you, uh, for your consideration today, uh, to add section 121.22G1 of the Ohio Revised Code for Executive Session to consider the employment um, or compensation of one or more public employees. Okay. Board, you've heard the recommendation to add 121.22G1. Um, to executive session today for employment or compensation of one or more employees. Is there a motion to add that to the agenda? I'll make the motion. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, call the roll, please. Commissioner Batchelor? Yes. Commissioner Painter? Yes. Commissioner Corcoran? Yes. So then now we're moving to item H, and this is a motion to go into executive session pursuant to section 121.22 G1 which is the employment or compensation of one or more public employees. Number three, which is at the Ohio Revised Code to confer with the prosecuting attorney concerning disputes involving the public body that are the subject of pending or imminent court action. Is there a motion to approve to go into executive session? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, call the roll, please. Commissioner Painter? Yes. Commissioner Batchelor? Yes. Commissioner Corcoran? Yes. Um, thank you for going into executive session. We will return shortly. We have returned from executive session. No decisions were made this morning. Um, we're proceeding now on to our agenda. Are there, we have anything else on the agenda this morning, Mr. Bixler? Uh, well, we have, um, I've put together the motions uh, as requested for the tabled item, and I also have um, another addition to the agenda as well. So however you'd like to proceed. Okay. Which one, which one would you like to do, this? So we're going to need a motion to untable uh, item number 13. 13. Let's start there. Okay. Could I have a motion to untable item number 13? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion on it? Okay, I have. Uh, we've prepared working. I need a roll. I need a roll. I apologize. That's right. Commissioner <laughs> Bachelor. Yes. Commissioner Painter. Yes. Commissioner Corcoran. Yes. And there was no Okay, now it's your turn. Right. So we have uh, two new motions for your consideration. Okay. Uh, taking that item off the uh, table. The first motion is um, establishing the Claremont County Communications Cost Center 2020 allocation rates. The second motion is establishment of the billing procedure for the 2020 cost allocation rates for the Comm Center. Okay, board, we have two additions in this morning as read. There are two additions to the agenda. Do we have a motion to add these? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, call the roll, please. Commissioner Painter? Yes. Commissioner Batchelor? Yes. Commissioner Corcoran? Yes. So let's proceed with item number one. So the first one, it is the recommendation of John Cascaden, Director of Department of Public Safety Services, with the concurrence of Mary, Kane, Mary K. Raines, Director of the Office of Management Budget, and myself, to establish the Claremont County Communications Center 2020 cost allocation rates necessary to recover the incremental cost from the users of the system, which represents a 20, which represents 21% of the actual 2020 cost of the operation of the center as computed 
based upon the 2020 actual billable dispatches and 2020 actual airtime usage. Using that formula, it's a rate of $9.98.53 per dispatch for public safety government user, $8.95.70 for other dispatched users, and then $1.11.48 per minute of airtime. Due to the unusually low volume of calls that can be attributed to the COVID-19 pandemic, a credit to said rates is hereby established based upon an additional $136,990.19 one-time contribution from the County General Fund, which lowers the incremental cost down to 15.6%, which matches the current 2019 billable rates to be invoiced to users in 2021 based on the 2020 actual call volume payable in full by May 21st, 2022 at the following rates. $7.41.61 per dispatch for our public safety government users, $6.65.35 per dispatch for our other dispatched users, and then $74.95 per minute of airtime for our other users of the system. All that being said, what this does is it has a $136,000 contribution from the general fund to cover those incremental costs. What that does is lowers the base rate, which we will bill at back to the 19 or 2019 rates. Before we move, be, before we, we, we've added these two to the agenda, correct? Yes, and we, we voted to add those two to the agenda. Yes, we have. But we voted to take 13 off the table. <clears throat> and so now 13 is on the desk here. So do we want to vote to disposition 13 and, and do away with that? We can, we can do these? that. Does that make so sense? It does. Um, item number 13 um, was the recommendation of John Kiskaden, Director of the Department of Public Services with the concurrence of Mary Raines, Director of the Office of Management and Budget and Greg Bickford, the Assistant County Administrator to establish the Claremont County Communication Center 2021 cost allocation rates necessary to recover the incremental cost from the users of the system, which represents 21% of the actual 2020 cost of the operation of the Claremont County Comm Center as, com as computed based on the 2020 actual billable dispatches and 2020 actual airtime usage. Said rates are established based upon the, addition, the additional 136 thousand nine hundred ninety dollars and nineteen cents one-time contribution from the county general fund which lowered the increment cost down to 15.6 percent to be invoiced to the users in 2021 and payable by may 1st 2022 um, at the following rates that were enclosed in the table okay so as read um, the board has tabled this item um, if the board wishes to vote at this time on this item to dispose of it we could do that okay and so therefore at this point we'll ask for a motion to dispose of item number 13 we are now have two other motions on the floor at the same time so um, could we have a motion so move. is there a second second any discussion on that hearing none call the roll please commissioner painter no commissioner bachelor that's to dispose of item 13 13 we go with these that two is, that we're now yeah. reading that is to indicate you do not wish to go forward with item number 13. 13. Because now we're presenting these two items to instead of 13. Right. 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 It's just a housekeeping right. to clean yes. that up. Right. Yes. Yeah. Okay. okay. So you haven't. Did you call all the roll? Um, commission, I'm sorry. Commissioner Painter, you said no. No. Commissioner Bachelor. Yes. Commissioner Corcoran. Yes. Okay. We're moving on to item number, the, the additions. The first one, number one. Uh, so for brevity, I will not reread the motion I just read. <laughs> Understand what it does is adds an additional contribution from the general fund to hold the rates for the current year to be billed next year at the 2019 rates. Okay. So that's setting the rates as you have in all past years, a similar manner. For all entities? For all entities. We have not the second motion, which you've added, will deal with the billing. This just sets the rate. Okay. All right. So at this point, we're asking for a motion on the, we have the motion on the floor. We're asking approval to establish the Claremont County Communications Center 2020 cost allocation rates 
as read in this document for I this is the add on number one. Is there a motion to I'll approve? Make the motion. Is there a second? Second. Any other discussion? Hearing none, call the roll, please. Commissioner Bachelor? Yes. Commissioner Painter? Yes. Commissioner Corcoran? Yes. Add on number two. Add on number two. So this is for uh, the Department of Public Safety Services, establishment of a billing procedure for the 2020 cost allocation rates for the Claremont County Communication Center. Recommendation of John Cascaden, Director of the Department of Public Safety Services, with the concurrence of Mary Kay Raines, Director of the Office of Management and Budget, and myself, to establish the billing procedure for the Claremont County Communication Center 2020 cost allocation rates based on the 2020 cost allocation rate with credit applied. For jurisdictions with no arrearages, the 2020 cost allocation rate with credit applied will be invoiced. For jurisdiction with an arrearage, the 2020 cost allocation rate based on actual billable calls will be applied to the 2020 invoice for the 2020 cost allocation rate with credit applied to be shown as a credit on any arrearage. All invoices will be distributed in November 2021 and due in 2022, except where other arrangements on any arrearages have been made. So, to summarize all that, the users will get a bill like they always do based upon their 2020 usage, which we know was lower. By the rate that you've established holding that rate, users with no arrearage will see a credit listed, so their effective rate will be what you've already established. For those with an arrearage, they will receive a credit due on their past balance. So when all the bills are said and done, the amount paid will be exactly the same in terms of everybody gets the benefit of the lower rate. And this allows us to deal with any past due balances uh, through the Office of Management and Budget. Okay. okay. So is there a motion to approve as read to establish the billing procedure for the Claremont County Communication Center 2020 cost allocation rates, which deals with the credits applied. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Yes. Yes. So we will then work with any entity that has a pass due amount to get this cleared up as soon as possible. Correct. Thank you. Yep. Any other discussion? Hearing none, call the roll, please. Commissioner Painter? Yes. Commissioner Bachelor? Yes. Commissioner Corcoran? Abstain. Do we have any other add-ons this morning now? Yes, I have um, one more for your consideration. And that is the uh, an add-on uh, for an amendment to uh, the Claremont County personnel policy with respect to the Claremont County classification plan. Board, you've heard the recommendation to add this on to the agenda motion to amend the Claremont County, what is it? The, the county's classification, classification plan. plan. Is there a motion to add this to the agenda? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, call the roll, please. Commissioner Bachelor? Yes. Commissioner Painter? Yes. Commissioner Corcoran? Yes. And for the motion? We have Ms. I Brandenburg have here. Well, hi. Hello. Hi, Terry. Good <laughs> to see you She's again. <laughs> She's walked on in. <laughs> recommendation of Sandra Tahat, Human Resources Administrator, with the concurrence of Thomas J. Eigel, County Administrator, to amend Appendix 4.09 of the Claremont County Personnel Policy and Procedure Manual with respect to the Claremont County Classification Plan to amend the pay ranges for the classification titles as out outlined in the table below and exhibit a attached thereto and made a part thereof effective october 6 2021 and further to authorize the update of the appropriate internet links and appendices accordingly so this is changing um, the proposal is to change class number 49130 which is vehicle operator non-cdl which is currently a pay range four to a pay range eight uh, class number 49131 which is vehicle operator cdl currently a pay range seven to a pay range 11. Class number 49134, which is CTC supervisor, currently a pay range 10 to proposed pay range of 13. And class number 49141, vehicle dispatcher, currently a pay range eight to a proposed pay range of 12. Board, you've heard the recommendation to amend um, the Claremont County class classification plan and with these changes as read by Terry Brandenburg. Thank you. Um, is there a motion to approve? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? I will say well deserved. Yes. <laughs> yes. 
Call the roll, please. Commissioner Painter? Yes. Commissioner Batchelor? Yes. Commissioner Corcoran? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. Thanks, Terry. One more One addition? More. <laughs> He's related. full of additions today. <laughs> Related to the action uh, you just took, we have one more. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. We have one more add on for personnel actions for the Claremont Transportation Connection. Okay, all so right. <laughs> Go ahead. We need an we'll add on. Add oh, add you might add it. Yes. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay, I'm not so used moved to your add. Second. Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, call the roll, please. Commissioner Painter? Yes. Commissioner Bachelor? Yes. Commissioner Corcoran? Yes. Now you can go. <laughs> so these personal actions that I'm going to read are for salary increases um, effective October 6, 2021. So the uh, Robert Hallgath, Administrative Supervisor 2, salary range, uh, salary increase effective 10 6 21. Carl DeCamp, CTC Supervisor, salary increase effective 10 6 21. John Hardy, and uh, CTC supervisor salary increase effective 10 6 21 Anthony range CTC supervisor salary increase effective 10 6 21 John Ansel vehicle operator part-time salary increase October 6 2021 Teresa ball vehicle operator salary increase 10 6 21 John Benson vehicle operator salary increase 10 6 21 Bernita Glasser, vehicle operator, salary increase, 10 6 21. Lawrence Hager, vehicle operator, salary increase, 10 6 21. Jennifer Harris, vehicle operator, salary increase, 10 6 21. Dale Knapp, vehicle operator, salary increase, 10 6 21. David Lewis, vehicle operator, salary increase, 10 6 21. Deborah Pringle, vehicle operator, salary increase, 10 6 21. Um, Amy Regensberger, vehicle operator, salary increase 10621, and Craig Gordon Miller, vehicle operator, non CDL, salary increase 10621, effective date. Board, you've heard the readings in the motion um, to increase the salaries for the employees as listed, and the changes are to be effective October 6, 2021, as read. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, call the roll, please. Commissioner Bachelor? Yes. Commissioner Painter? Yes. Commissioner Corcoran? Yes. Thank you. Any other add ons? Um, commissioners, if I may, <laughs> I sincerely apologize. Um, when we removed item number 13 from the agenda, we effectively brought that item back before the board. And um, subsequent to that, then we have um, established the rates under the two add-ons. My concern is when we brought back number 13, it, it was tabled, we brought it back before the board. We had a first, we had a second, and upon the roll call motion with two commissioners voting affirmatively, my concern is that we passed that, we, we passed that motion um, instead of the two add-ons that the board had intended. So I just wanted to briefly revisit that if we could. Um, when the item was taken off the table, um, Commissioner Painter um, had voted to remove the item. Commissioner Bachelor had um, seconded that we remove the item from the table. We brought it back before the board. Again, Commissioner Painter, Commissioner Bachelor um, repro approved the motion. Uh, the vote at the time was Commissioner Painter had voted no, Commissioner Corcoran had voted yes, and Commissioner Bachelor had voted yes, which I believe would have effectively passed the, that uh, motion. The motion, I believe, was. I think the the term you used was to dispose of that motion, yes. and I agree with Holly that when you put it back on the table, it was a recommendation to approve. So I think the the motion is to approve that item. Okay. So that would probably change the way the commissioners right. look at that item. So so, so how did, would you like us? So the, so did, how would you like us to do that? To first, number one, rescind it. Rescind. Okay, 13, let's rescind. And then uh, Holly would present it again as a recommendation to approve. That makes sense. Yep. Okay. okay, so we have a motion at this point to rescind the vote that we did on item number 13. Is yes, ma'am. Correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so is there a motion to do that? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, call the roll. Commissioner Painter? Yes. Commissioner Bachelor? Yes. Commissioner Corcoran? Yes. Now what motion do you want? And then we will have, um, we will take the item that was previously tabled, um, which was, again, the recommendation of John Cascaden, um, the okay, director. Number 13. Correct. Okay. Number 13. So now we're going to take 
a motion to take that off? That we are going to make a motion. The motion's going to stand that it, this was the recommendation to approve this. Okay. So um, since the board's intent, um, based on these subsequent uh, motions that were made, I can tell that the board's intent was, was not to approve this. Okay. So um, the recommendation was to approve. Okay. So we would need an, um, a motion to that effect. Okay. So we need a motion to approve item 13 as it was originally written, correct? Correct. Okay. Is so there a motion? So moved. Second. Second. Commissioner Painter. No. Commissioner Bachelor. So this is to remove it. This is this is to approve it, which okay. you I did no. not believe. You don't want to no. Approve. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. I'm so confused. And Commissioner You're right. Corker. All right. Then ready for me? Okay. No. No. <laughs> thank you so much. I sincerely I apologize. No, it's all right. Thank Everybody you. I just the board now. thank you so okay, much. Okay. Who's on first? All right. <laughs> okay. What else do we have? Any other additions, Mr. Brixler, this morning? None. Okay. Um, we did the county and staff elected official discussions this morning. Um, is there any member comments under item J, please? No, I'm too confused to comment. <laughs> That's <all> right. <laughs> okay, then we'll get you out of that state. Um, I'll ask for a motion at this time to adjourn this meeting. Is there a motion to adjourn? So oh, yes. moved. Second. Okay. Any other discussion? Hearing none, call a roll, please. Commissioner Painter. Yes. Commissioner Bachelor. Yes. Commissioner Corcoran. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today. We will see you next week.